cogency and firm determination. All diplomatic efforts made by ECOWAS in resolving the crisis have been defiantly repelled by the military leadership. It is crucial that we prioritize diplomatic negotiations and dialogue as the bedrock of our approach. Order the deployment of the ECOWAS standby force to restore constitutional order in the Republic of Niger. We begin the day with the possibility of war in Niger still very much on the table. Today, leaders from West Africa agreed to deploy a standby force that could be ordered to restore democracy in Niger if the country's military leaders do not. It's been two weeks since the military staged a coup there. Yesterday, the generals appointed a new government, showing no signs of backing down. It is seen as yet another act of defiance against open and veiled threats being made by West African leaders. Well, where is all of this headed? Could Niger and its neighbors be on a collision course headed for war? West African leaders arrived in Abuja to mull their next move. Their urgent meeting came after Niger's junta ignored their ultimatum to stand down from their power grab. The group says all diplomatic efforts to resolve the crisis have been rejected by the military leaders. Now they're ramping up the pressure to restore democracy, issuing this directive. Direct the committee of the chief of defence staff to activate the ECWA standby force with all its elements immediately. Order the deployment of the ECOWAS standby force to restore constitutional order in the Republic of Niger. But it still isn't clear what that will look like, with a standby force likely to take weeks, if not longer, to assemble. The bloc also reiterated its commitment to finding a peaceful resolution. Earlier, the junta took to national TV to announce a new government, with Niger's deposed president, Mohamed Bazoum, still under house arrest, concerns are growing about his well-being. We are aware of recent reports that President Mohamed Bazoum of Niger and his family are living without electricity, water, food or medicine, and I can say the following. The Secretary General is very concerned over the deplorable living conditions that President Bazoum and his family are reported to be living under as they continue to be arbitrarily detained by members of the Presidential Guard in Niger. As the political deadlock continues, the people of Niger are wary of what comes next. Really, after the coup d'etat, uh, our country really is live in the bad situation. Why I say bad situation? Because today, if we look everywhere, we can see Everywhere there is light up, light up, light up. I think it's going to be better to use the politician, I mean, politic intervene, not military intervene. Tough sanctions on Niger mean it's struggling with rolling power cuts and supply chain disruptions, creating further uncertainty for residents awaiting the next move in their country's future. Well, I'm joined now by Kamisa Kamara. She's the former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mali and is now a senior advisor on Africa at the U.S. Institute for Peace. Ms. Kamara, it's good to have you with us this evening. ECOWAS's first reaction last week to this coup, it, it was an ultimatum and a threat of possible military intervention in Niger. Now, the generals in Niger, they called ECOWAS's bluff. Today, ECOWAS doubled down on this possible use of force against Niger. Are we just escalating here one level to the next, possibly headed for a military conflict? We're definitely escalating. Um, I think the ECOWAS has really given a chance to diplomatic negotiations um, over the past two weeks. The, the coup took place two weeks ago. That's 14 days of President Bazoum being detained by the junta. Um, in very uh, difficult situations, and the junta just pretending that the ECOWAS isn't there any uh, any longer. Um, they appointed a government, uh, they closed their airspace, and they're really uh, very defiant uh, when it comes to, to the ECOWAS and the ECOWAS orders. Um, now we're seeing heads of states of the ECOWAS coming out of a summit today, even more determined that they were last week or the week before, um, showing their muscles 
and really telling the junta that they are giving them one more week to decide whether they want a military intervention or they want to restore constitutional order. Well, let me just ask you right now, as it, as it looks right now and based on what you know, do you think if the junta, if they don't back down, do you see this, uh, this force that was ordered, deployed today, do you see them moving into Niger? I think there are some legal considerations, operational and economic as well, when it comes to a military intervention. However, what I'm seeing is that the ECOWAS is really uh, playing its credibility. Uh, it has to show that as a regional organization, it exists for a reason, and that its threats are not empty threats. Um, Tinubu, President Tinubu of Nigeria, is also um, showing that Nigeria is the new leader of the ECOWAS, that he wants to move forward. Uh, he's made early declarations um, demonstrating that he was ready for a military intervention. Both Nigeria, as the leader of the ECOWAS, and the ECOWAS as a regional body, had their credibility on the line. Um, now, it's really hard to say whether a military intervention is going to happen. It would be speculation at this point. Mm -hmm. But what we can say, again, is that the ECOWAS is more determined than ever. Let me ask you a little bit about how we got here. Um, you know, your country, Mali, has seen three coups in the span of a decade. Niger has seen five since gaining independence. Military leaders in West Africa, they don't respect election results all the time, and they do so with impunity, and in the case of Niger right now, with quite a bit of public support. You were part of a democratically elected government. It must pain you to see what is happening. Why is democracy apparently so disposable in West Africa? Um, I've said it actually on, on, um, uh, on air earlier that I, I am doubtful that democracy as it is being um, uh, practiced um, in the West uh, actually works for African countries. Mm. Um, I believe that we really need to take a look at what citizens really want and sometimes so those presidents who are democratically elected are elected on very fragile grounds, mm -hmm. where not a majority of the population actually voted for them. And the way they conduct um, business um, is not considered satisfactory to the majority of citizens. And this is what we're seeing um, in, in West Africa and in the Sahel in, in particular. So what I personally feel or believe when it comes to democracy doesn't really matter here. I think we really have to, as Africans, um, to look at what democracy brings um, to, to the continent, but really to also demonstrate that democracy can deliver and will deliver in, in our different contexts. So, so you, you, I, you, I assume you're talking about, you know, the publics have to see the value of democracy, but also the, these military generals have to recognize the value of democracy. Um, if they don't, they're going to continue to stage these coups. I, I'm wondering who or what is going to show these generals that um, they're hurting themselves and their futures by you know, just throwing out election results all the time? Well, one way would be for the ECOWAS to really demonstrate its authority. I think mm -hmm. um, uh, mil the military, um, as, as we see, whether in Africa or anywhere else, functions better when there is a strong civilian authority in place mm -hmm. um, and where the military is actually subordinate to the civilian authority. Um, this civilian authority military uh, relationship has completely broken down in, in in the Sahel. And so what we need to do is really restore um, the trust between civilian authorities and the military leaders. And this could take decades. Niger's junta was quick to accuse France of taking advantage of the coup to violate Niger's sovereignty. Niger's colonial past with France, it seems to be low-hanging fruit for the generals. Is France, though, is it responsible for, for the general's behavior and for what has happened in Niger in the last few weeks? I think France is an easy culprit. Um, I think what we've seen in the Sahel in general is a rejection of 
uh, the French uh, policy in Africa, where France is being too present and to the point where it gets involved in domestic affairs. And so it was easy for the generals to mention France. France has been mentioned um, as a culprit in, in the previous coups in, in Niger, in uh, Burkina Faso and in Mali. Um, like you said, it's a very low hanging fruit. Um, it's hard to, you know, take this accusation seriously. Um, the causes of this coup are inherently domestic, and the reasons for the coup are very personal to General Chani. How concerned are you that um, all of West Africa could become a, a nest, if you will, for Islamist extremism, ISIS, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda? I mean, they're all invested in a, fu in a future with coups and failed states in the region. That is really the worst case uh, scenario, and I really don't want to believe in that in that scenario. I think that uh, what we're seeing with the ECOWAS doubling down on sanctions and uh, giving a, an ultimatum to the coup leaders in, in Niger is really to show that um, they are tired of coups and that they really want to put an end uh, to them. So I um, want to believe that the ECOWAS and the African Union will work together uh, to put an end to this uh, spate of coups. Whether they're successful or not will also depend on how strong the institutions uh, are being rebuilt in the Sahel region. And this cannot be done without uh, international support. So rhetorical uh, um, uh, announcements and communiques and um, uh, astonishments about what ha is happening in the Sahel region will not do it. I think what is happening in the region needs international support, an international coalition um, to really save the region. Let me ask you, you are with the U.S. Institute for Peace. Uh, does the U.S. have a role in Niger's future? I know it, it's invested money, it's invested men and women. Um, it's using Niger as a base for counterterrorism. But again, you have this element of hyper or, or more militarization within Niger. Yes, I think Niger is really a strategic country for both France and the United States. When it comes to the role of the U.S. Uh, in the Sahel in general, I think the U.S. has a lot to bring to the region, um, especially given the failed uh, French policy in the region. The U.S. doesn't have the legacy that France has in the Sahel region. And on top of that, the U.S. is really perceived as a very respected uh, partner. So it would it would be um, a very positive uh, way forward or move forward for the U.S. to be fully invested uh, in the Sahel, especially because coastal West African countries are a priority in the United States Global Fragility Act. Mm -hmm. It would make sense for the U.S. to also invest in the Sahel to prevent the issues of the Sahel from trickling down to the coastal West African states. Former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Mali, Commissioner Kamar, we appreciate you taking the time to talk with us tonight. It, valuable context and analysis at a very important time. Thank you. Thank you for having me.